Hi, and thanks for joining us again. I'm Ashley Ford here with PBS Books. We are at the Miami Book Fair talking to the brilliant memoirist, Glennis McNichol. Hello, Glennis. Hi, thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so first, let's just set up the book for okay. people who aren't incredibly familiar with No One Tells You This. <laughs> uh, the book is a chronicle of my 40th year. So mm -hmm. I turned 40. I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I felt a little overwhelmed by like what was to come and dreading it. I felt like I'd sort of been prepared to think of the remainder of my life as um, like nothing good could possibly happen to me because mm -hmm. as a single childless woman at the age of 40, I don't know, there's not a lot out there to suggest that it might be enjoyable, <laughs> right? <laughs> like worth your time. Um, and of course, I turned 40, and uh, that was absolutely not the case. And the year that followed was both uh, much more difficult than I anticipated. My mm -hmm. mother was very ill, and I ended up being uh, a primary caretaker for her. And on the flip side, I was in a position where I was doing a lot of traveling and having these great adventures. So I was mm -hmm. living both extremes that contradicted the idea that single women are objects of pity or spoiled. So right. I was both in the position of responsibility and also in this sort of like very exhilarating time. And it got right. to the end of the year and I felt, I'd felt so um, suffocated by the lack of stories that mm -hmm. seemed like they reflected my life. Like, I don't think we have really figured out how to talk about women's lives as if they're not a problem without a solution. Right. And the solution always seems to be the wedding aisle, or as I like to say, <laughs> the birth canal. Like, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> babies or husbands or right. seem to be the way we like to finish. And so I just, I got to the end of the year, I'd spent a lot of time complaining about the lack of narratives around women's lives and mm -hmm. I had that, you know, Oprah moment of being like, oh, I am the writer. Perhaps yes. I should shut up and put up. <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> you absolutely did. Mm, thank now, you. this is a book that I have been handing out. And I want to say this, you know, just for the record. Mm -hmm. Glennis is my butt, but also a brilliant <laughs> writer. Um, but this is a book that I've handed to friends who are at this place in their lives where they're starting to think, maybe I don't want a husband. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't want a baby. Yeah. What does my life look like right. if I don't have those things? Mm -hmm. And so I hand them this book and I'm like, it could be great. Thank you. Know? you. Like Thank they, you. there's going yeah, to be it could difficulty. Be, yes. But I think too, it's like, I didn't want, there's nothing prescriptive about this book and I didn't mm -hmm. want it to be like, I remember these books when I was a kid in the eighties, like 40 and fabulous, like a cheerleading book. I right. really wanted to make the argument like, I was leading a fulfilled life that was yes. full of all the complications and challenges and joys and struggles as anyone else's, which mm -hmm. when you're living, it seems obvious. But when we really look around us for examples of that, we're really hard pressed to find right. really hard pressed to like narratives around women's lives are pretty narrow just for yes. everyone. Um, and I think that we, you know, do ourselves a disservice, but it's been interesting to me talking to, I think the idea was people my age would, you know, the book might resonate with them. But what I've found is a lot of women, hearing from a lot of women in their 20s, mm -hmm. I think part of what the dread I was feeling and the anxiety was really rooted in having no idea what's coming. Right. It's like sort of being sent off into no man's land and no mm -hmm. one tells you what's out there. There's no blueprint. There's no nothing. And it's like right. terrifying, whereas at least we have an idea of what marriage can look like or what motherhood can look like. And if right. you don't want those things, it's like, oh, my God, I feel so overwhelmed by my what, choice. Yeah. What could happen? I'm terrified. It could right. be, there, maybe it's probably going to be awful. And it's, and you know, it, it is awful. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. just like marriage is awful. Sometimes. Yep. <laughs> That's what I've been told. Or like, <laughs> motherhood is awful sometimes, which yep. I don't know that mothers are allowed to say that as frequently as they probably should. It's, they're starting to do they're it. Start, more. They're getting, they're getting better yeah. at it. But like, but it's also amazing sometimes. And so right. I just wanted to say that, you know, yeah, absolutely. And one of the people who you actually sort of made real for me mm -hmm. in this book, because I am a late adopter of Star Wars. Right. <laughs> very, very late adopter right. of Star Wars. And you talking about Princess Leia mm -hmm. in the book really made me go, because it didn't even, it didn't hit me until right. I read your book, what Princess Leia must have meant right. when Princess Leia was like, on screen everywhere and, and everywhere. Can you talk about that? A I bit? think in the writing of the book too, and I really went back and thought about it. I was so lucky in the timing of my childhood. I was, mm. I was born in 74. Mm -hmm. And so the early eighties for me was when I really had like that childhood awareness. Mm -hmm. And that was the height of star Wars where literally yep. princess Leia was on like 
I say like pillowcases, mm -hmm. posters. She was in my <laughs> dentist's office. There were Star Wars figures at every checkout grocery line. And so you okay. were seeing this really, um, this woman with such agency who mm -hmm. in the only moment in that series where she's really overly sexualized is the moment where she like kills the person who's put her in a bikini with a chain. Yep. <laughs> and then simultaneously, I was also obsessed with Little House on the Prairie, the mm -hmm. books. And Little House on the Prairie, the TV show was on 24 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't... It was, it was as a child, when you're building this image of what you want yourself to look like and what you want the world to look like for mm -hmm. you, I was really surrounded by examples uh, that this was all possible for me. Right. And I leaned on those examples so hard, as we do. And I think, mm -hmm. I, I think as many writers and readers lean on the stories they read as a, as a guide, and my family didn't travel. So when I got to turn 40 and there was no stories and no examples to lean on, mm -hmm. I felt so terrified almost and I just like right. I felt the absence of it so keenly mm -hmm. because stories had played such a important role in my life right and we really do like to talk I mean Princess Leia is the one example of this is not true but mm -hmm. primarily when we talk about you know uh, adventurous women who have great agency and do what mm -hmm. they want we're almost always talking about girls before puberty yes. right that's how we're comfortable with yes. girls doing what they want and as soon as puberty hits those stories end and we are uncomfortable <laughs> oh yeah oh, once you start doing with what you want after puberty yeah. ends in literature you become dangerous you become dangerous or we shame you i think yes. is really important to remember the shame yes. i was feeling was a shame that's created because we do not like women on their own we right. do not like women in charge of their own lives i mean we know this when we hear lock her up chants or you know yep. put her in her place or even the original title of the book was Good Driving, which mm -hmm. was a quote from Thelma and Louise, which I love. But when we talk about women, like women drivers or bad mm -hmm. drivers, like we just do not like women in charge and solitary. We find every way possible to put them in their place. And on this book tour, I had yes. so many young women say to me, how do you eat alone? I want to learn how to do it. And I thought, I mean, I, how do you not eat alone? Right. <laughs> right. That's my reward for myself. But it yes. really, they were like, I feel sort of embarrassed or ashamed of myself and this is obviously out of side of new york yeah but i just thought wow like really think about what that means what do you have to be ashamed about that you buy your can buy your own meal that you like right. to have a moment alone at a bar and do like right we've internalized a level of shame about our about not being attached that i think we know who that benefits it's not us it's never been <laughs> it's us. never us no it's not us you know <laughs> and and one of the things that I actually really like about the book is that you assert the fact that you are not unattached. Right. You have family. Right. There are people who count on you. Yeah. You like, and, and that for me was massive oh, thank you. because I often think about the fact that I may not have children. Right. But I always want children in my life. Yeah. You know, I, I deeply like children yeah. and I think that they need me yes. in their life too. Yes. I just, it, absolutely. I think part of my frustration as I got older was not having the relationships in my life respected mm -hmm. in ways I thought my friendships that are so important to me and I'm important to those people. The children, this idea that if you don't have children or don't want children, that you don't like children, right. which I find offensive, yes. that I have a very, a life full of children and I value those relationships so much. And mm -hmm. growing up, I did not have examples around me of ways to live. And I felt their absence so keenly mm -hmm. that I want, I love being the person in my, my nieces and nephews yes. life and in my godchildren that that is the person that, that is a person outside of the, the parenting model mm -hmm. and friendships, which are so, yes. as women get married later and later, our female right. friendships are so important and sustaining. Yes. And yet, I talk about being at one of my best friend's weddings and having people say to me, don't worry, like it yes. can still happen to you <laughs> or not being able to express why it felt a level of grief about watching my friend recreate another life separate from mine because that forms my infrastructure around my life. But the right. grief was really like I had no way to express it because we don't right. respect and recognize and have a language around these relationships. So I kind of yeah. just wanted to mark mark have the book mark those things and say like I see these things and they are mm -hmm. important and there's and they play in incredibly important roles 
and we just don't have a language quite to recognize it quite yet. Nor do we have the narratives mm -hmm. that would bring us the language, right. you know, but until now, right. you know, like, we're so, it's people really say tough. to me when they're some film people I've spoken to are like, mm -hmm. we love this, but we just don't see the hook for this mm -hmm. book to adapt it. And I'm like, I think by hook, you mean, we don't have a wedding that we can, you know, the sitcom always yep. ends with the baby or the wedding. Like, yes. and after those two things happen, nobody can keep the ratings up anymore. Yep. So I just, I think we, we have internalized this to such a degree that it's so hard to understand how a narrative can work outside of this. Not for men. Nobody says to no. a man, like, no, yeah, no, no, no. nobody says no. that to men. No. You know, and there's a thing that I think about when I read your book and I think about the women um, who I know who are dealing with some of the same things mm -hmm. or, you know, in that place. And they all have adventurous spirits. Of course, yes. They all have adventurous spirits. Mm -hmm. These are not, you know, uh, these are not the women who you would expect right. to be, you know, stay at home moms yes. or anything like that. And, and it's not that they think there's anything wrong with that. It's just that that's not for me. Why that's do you think it's so hard for people to see a single woman of a certain age who doesn't have children and is fine with her mm -hmm. life and just say, you know, that looks beautiful yeah. even if it's not for me? The funny thing is I will say I've heard from... Uh, many married women with kids who loved mm -hmm. the book. And I think that speaks to how suffocating it can be for those women to not be allowed to mm -hmm. have a life outside of the role of mother or wife. Mm -hmm. But separate from that, financially speaking, practic practically speaking, not being married was an untenable way to live securely as a woman until very recently. And right. I think I mention this frequently, but in America, a woman couldn't have a credit card in her own name mm -hmm. until 1974. Yeah. And so part of this, I think, is that we created these narratives out of necessity to make realities attractive. Like mm -hmm. we, we really, who the happy ending of the wedding is really a happy ending for a man right. in many ways, but we've been really sold this idea of what our happiness is supposed to look like. Mm -hmm out of practicality because women couldn't yep. support themselves because, or they, I mean, they had, there was many single mothers who supported themselves, but not well. Right. And it was a struggle. Mm -hmm. I joke now that everyone's and not so much of a joke, but like everyone's second marriage now will be to a woman mm -hmm. because, because they can, because yep. the second marriage doesn't have to be to a man for financial reasons, which yep. I think for many or like the golden girls is of course the goal for all of us. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I think as we're, this is all very new. So it's maybe not, so surprising the narratives haven't caught up quite mm -hmm. yet but things have changed so quickly that it's like having to convince people makes you feel like you're defending yourself and I don't feel the right. need to defend myself I right. just feel a little there was a period of time where I was like please stop telling me don't worry I think <laughs> things will still be work out for you and I'm like right. I, I'm I'm standing here I just got off a plane from Paris and I'm in like a fur coat I'm like I'm, I'm not sure what you're like it's working it's out working. it's all working <laughs> it's working it's out fun. yeah so and it, you know and I appreciate people mean well much of the time but mm -hmm. they couldn't have imagined necessarily right. this reality mm -hmm. although people are always quick to point out to me that they always there's been single women before who lived outside of marriage I have an aunt is always the line. Everyone yes. always has an, I aunt. Have an aunt. Yeah. I'm like, who I am the aunt. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's who yeah. I am. Yeah. Aunt Glennis. Yeah, Aunt Glennis. One, and I, one of the things I like about the book is that it's not defensive. It doesn't right. feel like a justification of your life, which would be unnecessary. Right. What it sounds like more to me and what I think a lot of women could get from this book, and really anybody could get from this book, okay. is the idea that you eventually are going to have to figure out what you want right. outside of other people's expectations for your oh, life. Oh, that's so good. I'm going to borrow that when I explain <laughs> what my book is about. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me what the book is about. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I do think that that's really, I think, I think that is 100%. We all have to look at it. And the thing mm -hmm. is, I didn't want it to be defensive. I almost thought of it like a dispatch. Like, right. I, like I'd gone off into this place I was unprepared for and I was mm -hmm. writing a report because all the things I expected turned out to be not true. And I was like, let me just tell you what's actually going on. I'm setting right. this back as a report. And I didn't, I, I resent being made to feel defensive about my life. I mm -hmm. was like, I, I don't want to justify my life. I hate books like that. Yes. I don't want to read them myself. I right. loathe those sort of books. So I kind of just wanted to write like a good story essentially mm -hmm. like I wanted to center sounds a little narcissistic but the truth is I wanted to center myself as a single 
woman as the hero of the story because mm -hmm. I think primarily the aunt who lives upstairs, the single friend is always playing the supporting role against right. the character who is important because of what they're, and I just wanted to oh, be yeah. like, I, I am the, I am yes. the, you know, the center of but the you story. Are. Yeah. But, and I think that's what makes it work, you know, cause you yeah. could have written a book about single women right. in their forties, right. writing about your experience mm -hmm. as a single child-free woman, um, entering your 40th year and yeah. living that year is, riveting because it's so new but also because it's your story right i almost turned it into a novel at one point and then i thought that felt like it, yeah. i was chickening out a little yeah. like i was a little bit like i want to know that this is real like this i didn't have yes. to make this up it actually exists it actually yeah. exists and it's a wonderful book <laughs> thank, you, thank you so thank much. you so much for i appreciate this conversation. it oh this my so <laughs> thank you so much for joining us I'm Ashley Ford with PBS Books. This is Glynis McNichol, <laughs> and we are at the Miami Book Fair. We'll be right back, so don't go too far.